All right, so good day. Today, what we have before us is the this is the CX syllabus for the CSX syllabus for principles of business. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to go through the syllabus and pick out some of the more important topics that might happen to come on the CXC examination. Uh, is that every single topic that is in the syllabus, you know, is on the CXC paper? But some of them over the years have seen certain topics being more popular than others. So I'm um, going to try to go through the the main topics, such as you know, starting section by section. I'm going to start with section one, and I'm going to work my way through the syllabus, picking out what I think are uh, some of the more important topics that you might want to study for your upcoming CXC examination. So the first section we're going to deal with is the nature of the business. Now this on the screen is the CXC syllabus as I said before and you can download it from the CXC website or you can go to Notes Masters and get a copy. Okay so not a copy but get an on-screen version of it. So you can either go Notes Masters or you can go to you know the CXC website. So let's start with this. Let's start with the first topic here. The we explain the development of batter, explanation of the concepts, advantages and disadvantages of batter. Then describe the role of money, brief history from subsistence economy to money economy, and identify the instruments of exchange. So we're gonna deal with these three topics today. So let's start with the concept of batter. Batter. What is batter? No. A working definition for batter is the exchange of goods or services for other goods or services without the use of money. Now the main thing there is to remember that it's without the use of money. It's the exchange of goods and our services for other goods and our services without the use of money. So if I go and say, okay, I have a, a PlayStation 4 and somebody has an Xbox and you exchange. That's bartering right there. So one for one without the use of money. So that's an example of the bartering system. Now bartering goes way back. Okay, it's one of the first forms of trade that took place way back when. If you do your history, your, your, your CXC history, uh, or your student of history in general, you'll know about the, the Amerindians and the early men who used to conduct bartering. That's how old bartering be. Way back in subsistence economies. Subsistence mean, you know, you are only making enough for you to sustain you and your family. That's subsistence um, economy. You're making enough for you and your family. Not enough for, not a surplus for trade with, you know, the wider community. So bartering goes way back to this economy. So this system, the subsistence system, is where bartering was most prevalent. Now, you really you don't really use battering much today. Now there's a reason for that. Because battering have there are certain inherent difficulties in the battering system. There's some problems associated with the battering system. Some of which include coincidence of wants. What does this mean? Coincidence of wants mean that both parties must be willing to trade. So here so what what what, what do you mean by that? So let's say I'm a farmer and I'm producing corn. But I would like to get some sweet potato. I now have to take my corn, go to the market, find somebody who is producing potatoes, but happen to want corn that I have, so that we can conduct a bat exchange. So you actually have to find somebody who wants what you have, and you want what they have. Let me see how many things have to line up there. Now you have to find somebody who producing potatoes who happen to want corn. So that's where the coincidence of want comes in. You have to find somebody who wants what you have and you want what they have. And you can see where this can be problematic because you might spend your whole day hunting down somebody who wants what you have and you want what they have. So you have your corn on your back, you're going all day like looking for people. Like you see somebody with the potatoes, like would you like to exchange some potatoes for some of my corn and they'll be like no i'm looking for somebody with let's say flour or somebody who has irish potato or somebody who have carrots 
you know, or some of them are meat. So right there, you are eliminated from that bad set, that trade. So that's the problem of coincidence of ones. And next problem associated with the battering system was a rate of exchange. Okay, the rate of exchange. What does this mean? No. Let me go back to the example I used before. I'm producing my corn. So I have about, you know, one bag of corn. And you have your sweet potatoes. No. You might feel as though your sweet potatoes are worth more than my corn. So you're going to be like, okay, your one bag of corn is worth two bags of my sweet potatoes. But in your mind, you'll be like, no, I put a lot of work into my corn. My corn is at least worth one bag of sweet potatoes. So you see where the problem comes in. Both parties have to agree on an exchange rate. Some might think that theirs is more valuable than the other. So that's a problem right there. But you know, with money today, money solves some of those problems. So an exchange rate is needed for each trade. You have to set up, okay? One bag of potato equal one bag of corn. Or two bags of potato equal two bags of corn. Or two bags of corn equal half a bag of potato. Whatever, whatever the exchange rate is, but yeah, there needs to be an exchange rate for battering to take place. Without the exchange rate, then that's an issue. Our next problem with the battering system is some goods are not divisible. Some goods cannot be divided. You have to understand that this is way back when, before the days of, of refrigerators and the days of, you know, ways to properly store your, 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 your goods. So some goods are just not divisible. Now, for example, let's go back to the corn again. You have a bag of corn where you're looking for, let's say, some meat. You can go to a pig farmer and say, okay, I have a bag of corn. Can I get one leg off of your live pig? Like, how, how, how does that work? Should the farmer cut off the leg of his live pig, give it to you in exchange for his corn, and take back his pig with three legs home? Like, that can't work. You don't want a tripod pig for uh, for yourself. So that's why you're talking about divisible, uh, divisibility of goods. Some goods cannot be divided. It's either you take the whole pig and give me the corn that values my pig, or we just can't do any exchange. So there we see a problem with batter. Some goods just cannot be divided. You cannot divide a live animal and expect it to survive. You cannot say one well, just piece of the pig, the, the, the cow, and then you take back the one with the tree leg for milk. Like you'll be milking a tree legged cow. I don't think so. So that's the next problem with the battering system. Some goods just cannot be divided. Another problem with the battering system is that, like I mentioned the fridge earlier, some goods can't easily be stored. So we're saying, you have your products. You realize I'm using a lot of agriculture-based examples because back in the day, subsistence, most subsistence economies were you know, agrarian, agricultural-based. So yeah, some goods cannot easily be stored. You cannot really put up your produce for an extended period of time. So you have to go and get them traded as quickly as possible. But as we have seen earlier, some of the, some of the problems with batter don't allow for easily for the goods to be easily traded. So it might come to a point where you have your lot of tomatoes that spoil rather easily, you have your milk, and then you end up giving them away because you just can't take them back home to the store. Where are you going to store them? There's no refrigerator. All right, maybe some of the techniques back then were not, were not sufficient in storing produce longer. So these are some of the problems that are associated with the battering system. Okay, so the four you see on screen, you have your, your coincidence of wants. Both parties must be willing to trade, meaning I have to find what I'm looking for and you have to have what I want for us to trade. Exchange rate is another problem. Both of, both of us have to agree on what our, our, our products are worth. For the third one, some goods are not divisible. Some goods, as I said, a live animal cannot be divided in order to exchange it for something else. And the last one, some goods cannot easily be stored. You don't have any refrigerators, goods can spoil easily. So that's a problem with the battering system right there. All right, let's move it on now. Now, what, how was this problem solved? This problem was solved with the use of money. Money have about four major uses. A medium of exchange, a measure of value, a store of value, and a standard for deferred payments. But before we get into that, let's, let's, let's roll back the clock a bit. Like money, how, does money, how did money come about? Now after the battering system, people began realizing that the problems associated with the battering system. 
So they sought a way to solve this problem. Now, if you, again, if you're a student of history, or even just by knowing, back in the day, people actually started using various things as currency. People started using, you know, shells, seeds, stones, eventually evolved into the use of metals. You know, you had your copper coins, then you had your silver, then you had your gold, and then after gold, we, get, we came into the money that we see today. Okay, as time progressed, you use more and more valuable uh, materials as money. So if you look at your old ancient movies or your, your movies back in the Roman days, you see your, your coins made from silver or gold. That was the currency of the day. Now, money as we have it today doesn't really have a value per se. It's paper or plastic, whatever it's made from. The actual material doesn't have a value. You know, gold at face has a value. An ounce of gold has a certain value. A piece of paper doesn't have any value. But where money gets its value from today is from the authorities. Okay? It's what you call fiat, fiat money. This money is backed by the government, backed by the authorities, backed by whoever is in charge. They say that this dollar is worth one dollar. And as such, that's how it is. It is backed by the government. So they say, that's why they call it illegal tender. The authorities signed off and said, this is valued at that. Now, back in the day, each, each, each currency at face value was backed by that amount of gold. That's why you call it gold standard. So back in the day, if you had $5, then that $5 would have been backed by five pieces of gold in the bank somewhere, or five, the value of the, the, the money in gold somewhere. But eventually it came to a point where there wasn't enough gold to match the amount of money that people want. There wasn't money circulating. So eventually they had to done away with the gold standard, where the money was backed by gold, the value of gold, and introduced the legal tender, the fiat money, the money that we have today. Okay, so money as a, that's enough about down memory lane, let's about money as a value of exchange. That's kind of self-explanatory. Medium of exchange, money. So you go to the shop, you buy a, a, a soda for $3. You go up to the cashier, you take the soda, go up to the cashier, give them $3. That's it. A medium of exchange. I give you three dollars. I get to keep the soda. That's one of the use or the function or the role of money as a medium of exchange. You go to the shop. You see something for five dollars. You take it up. Give the cash at the five. You go on with the product. That's it. You exchange one for one. Remember, bartering is the exchange of a product or service for another product or service. This time, in money, you can use the act the money and exchange it for a product. Money as a measure of value. Again, same, same, same explanation. You go into the store, you look at a product, you see $10. That's it, that's the value of that product. The product is actually $10. That's the value of the product. And it can only be you, it's given that value based on the money, the, the, the paper dollar, the money that backs it. So a product that says $10, that's the measure of the value of that product, $10. Okay, as a store of value, money as a store of value. What does this mean? Money can be used to, be, to, to, to store a person's wealth, a person's riches, a person's value, well, not your, well, a person's value. Okay, store of value. So you go to the bank, you put on $100 on your account, you can leave it there, and you can store that $100, you can add more and more and more to it. But you can now store. Remember back in the day, that had an issue with storage. You couldn't store the products. But today, money don't really spoil. Money don't spoil. So you put it in the bank, and it can be left there over years, over years, and store and build your value, build your wealth. Okay? Money as a store of value. Money as a standard of deferred payments. Okay? What does this mean? What this means is that money can be used to, let's say, credit things. Back in the day, you know, the battery system, I don't think you could have said, okay, I give me a pig today, and tomorrow, I'll bring back the, the, the change, or I'll bring back the, the, the put it for you, you know, That's, that wasn't really practical for you, because you set out on your day to exchange one thing for the next. But with money, you can actually credit things, you can actually buy, uh, get something today and pay later, okay, because like I said, the money don't spoil, the money is there, you can get it today, get the product today, and pay it later, a standard for deferred payments. So that's basically a brief rundown of barter 
and money. All right. Now, money today, the money that we have today, has certain characteristics. There's certain features that make something worth being used as money. The first one, it has to be durable. Okay, it has to be durable. Meaning it can be stored. Now, I know many people have made this mistake before. You have on your pants, you have some money in your pants, you wash your pants, when you, when you can't take it out the machine, it's right there, the, the, the paper is right there. It's not destroyed, it doesn't disintegrate. It can actually go on for a few more, a few more years. So money must be durable. And in the Oasis this year, they are going to even upgrade the type of material that the money is being made from. From the more paper to a more plasticky kind of material. So the money is going to become even more durable. It cannot be destroyed easily. And next thing, money has to be widely accepted. As in, it's legal tender. Now, a lot of us live in different areas. And as such, we have different currencies. Some currencies are more valuable than others. For example, you live in Jamaica, the Jamaican currency tend to be rated a little lower than let's say the East currency. So if I come to an Eastern Caribbean country and I'm using Jamaican money, you might not be widely accepted. And as such, you cannot really use it as money because in the OECs, you don't really accept the Jamaican dollar like that. So you have to be widely accepted for it to be used as money. It has to be a legal tender. In the OECS, our bank is the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. And they say that, look, this EC dollar is a legal tender. They don't vouch for, you know, some other currencies. Like again, the Jamaican dollar. The Eastern Caribbean Bank is not going to say, like in St. Kitts, the main currency is the Jamaican dollar. No, it's not really widely accepted. So for something to be used as money, it must be widely accepted as legal tender. Money must be divisible. Remember, we were talking about bartering earlier, and we said that some goods just cannot be divided. We cannot divide an, a live animal to get an next product. You cannot cut off the ear of a pig or the neck of a pig and expect the pig to survive and then exchange your head for something else and take back home the rest of the body. No. So money solves that problem by being able to be divided into smaller units. You can break down a $5 bill into you know, individual you know, singles. You can break it down into quarts. Uh, quarters you can break it down further into cents you know five cents ten cents right down to one cent okay so money can be divided that's why when you go to shop you give them a 20 something costs 15 you get back a change money can be divided into smaller units money must be portable meaning can be used in many locations now one of the problems back in the day when with gold is that gold was heavy gold is heavy silver is heavy so sometimes you see a merchant traveling and they have this big thing, you know, of, of coins bagging them down. That wasn't really, you know, practical. Money should be portable. Today we see all the paper money, the paper currency, and even the, the, the coins have been made from, you know, an alloy that's very, very light. Over the years, we realize money, you drop them on the floor, they sound hollow now because the money has been made from lighter and lighter and lighter material. So you must be able to carry the money wherever you want. You put your, your, your bills in your wallet and you go. So it should be portable. All right, fungible. One unit can be exchanged for another. So money should be able to, one unit of money should be able to exchange for another. So I have a five, should be able to exchange it for an next five or whatever. So it should be, one unit can be exchanged for another. And then of course, scarce. Scarce, the money should be scarce. How, okay, you, you might ask, well, how, how money is not that scarce, the paper money is not that scarce. But in this case, what they're talking about is the fact that the money cannot easily be replicated. All right, your money cannot easily be replicated. You have all kinds of security features built into the paper money that makes it difficult to forge. So in a sense, it is kind of scarce. It is limited. It is, you know, finite. Whatever money is in the system, that's what it is. You cannot really make your own money. So in a sense, money is scarce because of the security features and the materials made from it can't really replicate that on a regular, a readily basis. So that is, these, these are the nature, this is the, 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 these are the characteristics of money. Okay, durable, widely accepted, divisible, portable, fungible, scarce. These are the main characteristics or features of money.
Okay, not to be confused with the uses of money as a medium of exchange, a measure of value, a store of value, a standard for deferred payment. Those are the uses, okay? The roles of money, durability, acceptability, visibility, portability, fungibility, scarcity. These are the characteristics or the features of money. So do not mix up the uses of money with the characteristics of money. Okay, totally, to the totally different things. So again, let's do a little recap. You have the barter. What is barter? Barter is the exchange of goods or services for other goods or services without the use of money. That's the definition of barter. So you write that in the exam, the definition of barter. Now, barter was done mainly back in the subsistence economies way back then. You know, where you, you produce enough just for yourself, your family, and not enough to engage in a surplus or to have you know trade with the wider community or trade with the country okay so that's when, when battle was most popular now battle system had a number of inherent difficulties some problems were built into the battle system such as coincidence of wants an exchange rate is needed for each trade some goods are not divisible and some goods cannot easily be stored coincidence of wants refer to the fact that you have to find someone who wants what you have and you want what they are offering that's a problem exchange rate means that both parties have to agree on the value of their product versus the other person's product in order for them to exchange properly some goods are not divisible some goods cannot be divided some goods like live animals cannot be divided some goods cannot easily be stored again no fridge no nothing they spoil easily so they can't easily be stored so all these are problems associated with the battle system. Money came in to solve some of these problems with the battle system just for the mere fact that money can be used as a medium of exchange. It can be used as a measure of value. It can be used to store, your, to store value and it can be used as a method of, of, of deferred payment. Okay? Money. Money has certain characteristics or features such as it must be durable must be widely accepted, must be divisible, portable, fungible, and scarce. Okay, so that's basically it for this first part of the syllabus that speaks to, that speaks to, you know, explain the development of barter, describe the role of money. Okay, now we're going to look, next time we're going to look at various instruments of exchange.